spread the fire welcome back to smwx and today i am joined by the inimitable the irrepressible author broadcaster and just all around interesting and dynamic human being i can finally get my revenge and interview him <laughs> Because he's put me on the end of so many difficult questions, Eusebius Makaiser. So good to be with you. Thank you for having me on your platform. It's <laughs> strange to have a, a role it reversal. Is, right? yeah. yeah, I feel like so much of our conversations are you interviewing me <laughs> very generously. So just you wait. Unscripted, you can ask me whatever you want. I'm, I'm ready for it. Really appreciate yeah. that. I And know, congrats on this platform, by thanks, the way. Thanks so much. Uh, for you to grace it this early on is, is a big honor for us. So. Uh, there's so much I want to ask you, like, we could have a two hour conversation just about your biography, which I think is fascinating, and which I think a lot of people don't appreciate fully. But since we're here to talk about the election, I want to jump straight into it and, and get your thoughts on where our country is. I think there's a lot of immediate analysis, mm. but seldom we step back and, and say 25 years, like nothing's happening for this 25 year anniversary, really. Mm. We're facing our next general election is this a calamity is this a crime scene is this an unsung success story how do yeah. you assess where our country is yeah. right now i think our country is a hot mess right now and i think after 25 years of democracy historical excuses for tardy service delivery a lack of ethical and excellent leadership in the state no longer hold any water i think many of us especially older south africans have been willing, and to some extent rightly so, says we're to discount some of the sins of incumbency by saying there are legacy problems. But I, quite frankly, I think a quarter of a century, seriously, seriously, is enough time to dent some of the indices that we were gifted by history, but which we haven't really made much progress on. Inequality is just absolutely ghastly. We are probably the most unequal nation on earth. Uh, not even nation, society, we're not a nation really levels of unemployment, poverty, levels of corruption. And there's some things that you can't blame the Nets for. You can't blame the Nets for state capture. They maybe role modeled it, but the ANC-led government have to be held responsible for the continuities with the pre-1994 regime. And how do you assess the moment that we're in now, the sort of post-Zuma moment? Because it feels to me very much like this new politics of pseudo-hope has returned. And I'm not sure that there's been a radical critique of this moment, especially in, in the mainstream media. Yeah, I would agree with you. There's no post-Zuma mo moment, it's business as usual. And I think what's really happened is that, especially middle-class South Africans, have simply fallen for the coconut, I don't know where he got it from because he's too old to have gone to a Model C school, the coconut <laughs> tones of President Cyril Ramaphosa. Yeah. And there's something about his calm his well-spokenness that envelops you psychologically once he speaks. And I think we've been hoodwinked because Nazrek was supposed to be the post-Zuma moment that becomes more than a moment, that becomes a new dawn. Mm. But it's business as usual. We have blackouts. We have sudden increases again in our uh, petrol price with a consequent impact on inflation that is going to increase. Mm. Uh, we don't know what the rating agencies will tell us next, next week. Uh, for example, etc., etc., etc. So I don't see what the elation after Nazrek has given us, both inside the ANC, for those who are interested in ANC renewal, and then more importantly for us as citizens inside the South African state, it's really business as usual. And of course, the most, the most stark, I think, evidence of this, I mean, there's lots of evidence, but most recently perhaps is the ANC's list of people that it wants to second to parliament. If you get rid of Jacob, of, of uh, President Sora Maposa on that list, that is a list that could have been written for 2014. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my question to you following that then is, have we, have you, as someone in the media, leveled a radical enough critique? Because I feel like when we speak about this new dawn moment, we fall into language that gives Ramaphosa, even in our critique of him, a way out. Whereas when we critique other parties, um, I look at the critique of the DA, which is radical and strong, the critique of the EFF, which is radical and strong, which is right. But with Ramaphosa, there's always a caveat. There's always a, but shame, poor Cyril tone. And 
do you think you may have fallen victim to that? No, I think I've done enough. Um, but but let me speak about the media overall. Mm. And we can take some examples, right? Sure. I mean, you and I have had debates about the South African media. There's no such thing as the media. Yeah. So you are right to ask me a question about Eusebius. Sure. And if you think I've been to softening, you, you can critique me mm. in terms of my writing mm. and in terms of my radio platform. But I think in general, the media have given him a free, free pass. And he's not the only one. There are other people yeah. that are likable. And once you are likable, mm. you tend to be treated with kid gloves. And I'll give you two examples. David Makura. Yeah. David is likable. He's like a teddy bear. Mm. And so once he speaks, our critical faculties just yeah. go south. Another example, Pravin Gordon. I mean, Pravin Gordon tells us that we are expecting of this government to have a magic wand to deal with the energy crisis. No, we're not. I mean, yeah. as the Sunday Times, and there's a good example of a good critique, mm. the Sunday Times an editorial this past weekend says, no, Praveen, we're not asking you to create magic. We're asking you to do your job, Yeah. right? But there isn't enough of that. If we had to do a media analysis, I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And for me, what's really interesting is often the people who, let's say, mainstream radio, TV, and print media are sympathetic to are those who have the best grasp of the English language or the most pleasant access, uh, accent that happens to appeal. Because when you think of Makura, Ramaphosa, Gordon, all they seem to be able to do to me is speak to people in the media in ways that they feel I think that's true, but I think it's worse and more complicated than mm. that. Remember, journalists are human beings first, mm. and we are South African before we are professionals quite frankly mm. so we have the same tendencies as the public sure. we have a desperate desire as journalists because we are South African first and human first mm. to also feel good about the country and optimistic about it yeah. and it's extremely hard in that context by the way to be an outlier and to say let's have an honest conversation Bafana Bafana did not just win the World Cup because <laughs> people want you to the hope motif is a very South African yeah. thing. Oh, absolutely. So what I mean by, by it's more complicated than what you are saying, but what you're saying is part of it. Mm. Go back to Polokwane. I don't think the most fluent person in the English language mm. is Jacob Zuma. Mm. But a lot of the media was also excited about him taking over from Tabo, mm. who was far more in command of the English language. So it's not just a linguistic term. Yeah. And there, there was the desire desperately to have someone who's not like the guy currently in charge, who is not aloof, mm. who is mm. not peddling um, all sorts of AIDS denialism, who is not stoking unnecessary racial tensions in his weekly news, newsletter. Mm. And Jacob Zuma would be the counterexample, not quite a counterexample, but the compli complicated case study for your thesis, mm. in the sense mm. that mm. a lot of people in the mainstream media embraced him because he was not Thabo and Becky. Yeah, yeah. But I think we would agree that he's not the poster child for, for coconutism. Sure, sure. And, and I think there are interesting nuances in terms of our desire for hope. And every time a new ANC leader emerges, this quite naive narrative That's that right. surrounds them that I think we've, we've replayed in this Ramaphosa mm. moment. And so let's speak a little bit about different political parties and their campaigns and just your assessment with your analyst hat on about, let's start with the ANC since we've been speaking about this Ramaphosa moment. How do you assess the campaign? We've got what appears to be crisis after crisis on the one hand, but seemingly robust ANC support on the other. So this irony is something that I think demands some form of analysis. This country would be amazing if the ANC were to run the state as incredibly well as it runs election campaigns. <laughs> We'd be living in a, in a paradise. <laughs> if you study the ANC since 1994, they get timing right. They're often out of the starting blocks a little bit later than the official opposition. They are very good at getting people out on the day to vote. Last two, two or so elections, slight interesting changes in mm. trends, mm. but not enough yet for us to say that there is a pattern that is completely different. The elections machinery in Lutuli House, it works quite well. It works quite well. So the ANC knows what it is doing in terms of connecting with people on the ground. I think the ANC does care what you think, what I think, what a 702 audience mm. think, what a mail and guardian reader thinks, but ultimately they also know that we're not the majority. So they also know where to go and campaign and where to care about and how much to not worry too much about some 2000 word essay written in the Daily Maverick. So they really get elections. So I think in that sense, from their point of view, they're doing well. From the point of view of the country, I think it is appalling that there is an extremely high chance, near certainty, 
that the AMC will probably get somewhere between, I don't know, 57% and 62%. Because this election should be an, a referendum on 25 years of ANC governance. And if our competition was sufficiently healthy in our politics, you and I should be sitting here knowing that the ANC would be lucky to get 49%. So the question is, is that because they're doing something right? Absolutely not. It's for your follow-up question. It's partly because they are benefiting from what is not being done well on the part of the opposition. And let's, let's speak to that because I think one of the interesting aspects of your work has been critiquing opposition politics also as a way of contributing to democracy. And when we look at the DA, we'll come on to the EFF as well. Mm. How are you assessing the DA's campaign at the moment? Bad predictions or at least sort of early predictions are that their worst case scenario might be stagnation for mm. the first time. Um, on the other hand, their electoral machinery is strong in the suburbs. So who knows what could happen sure. with rolling blackouts. <laughs> um, how do you assess what they've been up to this election? I think their campaign is pathetic and incoherent. And what I mean by that is <laughs> they go from, they react to every news event rather than strategizing from a position of these are our five signature policies. And despite what you see, says, the public isn't interested in, the, in ideology. Or if you're ideology driven, you might say, I know we're not going to speak ideology to the masses, but we need to fix our identity and ideology and then that's not going to be our, our strategic comms, but our, our signature policies and our simple plain language messaging mm. will then be derived from understanding who we are. And they don't have that right. Mm. I can't tell you, despite someone who studies the DA closely, how they would deal with income and wealth and asset inequality. I can't, what I can tell you is I don't think it's even a liberal party. I don't think Musi is a liberal. Helen Zilla is not really a liberal, not in my definition. So they are, they are completely messy and confused in terms of identity and ideology. And if you put that aside, because people around us here can't eat ideology, they don't have any clear signature policies on the most urgent questions of the day, which are land, poverty, unemployment, growing the economy. And all you see is you know them reacting to one news mm -hmm. item to the next. Mm -hmm. And I think Musi will be extremely lucky um, and pray to, to his God that they should get at least 25%, mm. but there are no guarantees. And given what the ANC is doing wrong, it is appalling that the DA can't guarantee that it will get at least 30. And uh, let's move on now to the other opposition party, the EFF, and, and try and assess Your where faith? you think they are. <laughs> I thought they were, I've seen you in a red beret before. I'm like... <laughs> I think they're the most astute party in terms of having blinkers and completely ignoring the noise. Mm. And so one needs to assess parties a bit like you do book reviews. You can either do, do the, I wish this is what was in the book. Yeah. Or you can say, let me review this thing for what it sets out to be. Unlike the DA, by contrast, the EFF is getting on with what it is setting out with its vision. Mm. It is very clear as a radical party that is critiquing the material injustices of our land. And it doesn't care that an Adam Abib, a Karima Brown, mm. maybe to a more, in a more tempered way, Eusebius Mackayser disses them on radio or in a thought piece. They are very, very clear. We're going to go to Chatsworth. We're going to tap into the discontent of a majority of black people in this region who feel marginalized from opportunity. Now, I may find aspects of that, and I do, by the way, yeah. to be completely race reductive in a way that is unhealthy for our politics. But I think what the EFF has got right is certainty. Hmm. And certainty, I think, will get it, get it quite far. Um, I was one of those people who had to eat my proverbial hat because I thought my Lama's career was over after he was DC'd by the ANC. Yeah. I was wrong. Most pundits were wrong. And most of us have not admitted that we were wrong. And um, I think we can't rule out the possibility of the EFF getting 10%. What do you make of the radical critique of the EFF a la those who paint the party as fascist um, or who think that it is a danger to democracy and should be removed from the ballot? No, it shouldn't be removed from the ballot. And I disagree with political analyst um, and my colleague and friend Karima Brown. If you don't like the EFF, don't vote for them. They shouldn't be removed. And if you think that someone is fascist or proto-fascist, just describe them. The best thing to do to someone or a party or an institution that you think is anti-democratic is to describe them and win the argument, right? So I'm committed to that as a liberal. 
Um, I'm disappointed in them, to be honest with you, Sizue, because I think that they've got some of the most energetic, smart, strategic thinkers in our body politic. And I don't think it's necessary for them to panic and resort to the kind of stoking of racial fires that we've often seen from them. The arrestment of Karima Brown and many other journalists, she's just the latest example, sure. is completely unacceptable. I expect them to theorize violence far more carefully. And also as a result of that, some of their worst critics get away with being lazy in the criticism because they've also been sophisticated. Yeah. They have at times, as you have pointed out, used the institutions of democracy within the game's rules. Mm. In Parliament, they've often done that. They've used legal activism to try and get Jacob Zuma to do what he should be doing constitutionally. Mm. So their toolkit is very diverse. But my disappointment as a commentator and as a, as a liberal egalitarian is that sometimes when they have a moment of panic, they, they reach for the wrong thing in the toolkit. Mm. And there will be short-term gains. Um, but in the long term, I think our politics is worse off when we have demagogu demagoguery unnecessarily, when quite frankly, you've got a brain's trust that probably could map out a far more sophisticated election mm. strategy, if only it will allow itself to breathe and to not panic. So you mentioned your commitment to liberal egalitarianism, and I think that's a really interesting vantage point through which to view our society. And I've always wondered, because I hear you on politics, I hear you on social issues, but your views on the economy are often not quizzed. And I, I wonder how you view questions of structural inequality, which you constantly refer to, on the one hand, with your commitment to liberal values as you define them, and also quite a strong critique, as I understand you, of statist leftism, mm. which is also usually part of the structural economic critique. Mm. So w what are your views on, on the economy and how we you know, dig ourselves out of yeah. the structural rut? I think that's a stunning question. I wish we had an hour. I'm going to give you the short version and keep it also as plain as possible sure. for our audience today. Um, firstly, just on a point of dialogue, mm. I think we don't ask liberals enough questions about economic justice. Mm. And it's mm. a very awkward question for many people in the DA, by the way, and commentators who support them even if they're not party members. Yeah. So I'm glad you've asked me that question. Sure. For me, I'm not opposed to the state playing a very large interventionist role in our economy. I think it must do that. Mm. I've got a problem with this state. Mm. I don't have a problem with the state, mm. as in states are necessary mm. because markets do not have a sense of morality. Markets don't ask questions such as, what is a fair wage? Yeah. What is a fair cap on executive salary? Markets don't ask those questions. So anyone who is addicted to the market as a way to resolve very important moral and political questions are stupid or deliberately trying to reinforce the status quo because they probably benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So on a point of principle, and I'll stop you in a second, I'm perfectly okay with the state having an important big interventionist role. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with the current ANC-led state, so we need to separate those two sure, things. Sure. On the specific practical policies, let's say I was in government, what are the kind of things I would punt I'm waiting with for my you colleagues? To get into politics, it would be things it would be things like capping executive salaries, yeah. it would be things like upping minimum wage levels, it would also be probably on something like the debate around land mm. reform, which mm. is a big issue. I see absolutely no reason why people who do not have just acquisition of the land that they're currently on should be compensated market levels. At most, they should be getting nominal amounts for what they've added in terms of adding to the value of the land that they got through unjust means. But um, I wouldn't lead a government that was prepared to settle for market prices of land, for example. So I think there I'm probably committed to very similar kinds of policies as someone mm. like yourself, which is why I confuse people when I say that I'm a liberal. Mm. Because in this country, liberal is taken to mean DA. I'm not a DA member. I've got lots of beef with the DA, but as a philosophy student, liberal means something very different to me than it might to Helen Zille or to Musi Maimane mm. or to John Stianese. Well, I mean, I feel like we're just getting started <laughs> and there will be lots more bonus material on the WhatsApp channel specifically, so make sure you tune into that. Um, but for now, we're going to end this particular conversation here. We, we need to keep going because it's, it feels like we, we just started scratching the surface on so many issues. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm all yours. <laughs> Can't wait to, to talk race, to talk your identity as a queer man in South Africa and stay tuned for 
some more of those conversations as we go on SMWX. SMWX. No young people are around the decision making table. Let some new voices come to the fore. Follow us on WhatsApp and catch us live Tuesdays and Thursdays. Out with the old, in with the new. SMWX.